Today on The Big Questions, gaining power through populism, the route to happiness, and forgiving the people who hurt us. I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. Today we're live from the Michelston Community College in Cardiff. Welcome everybody to The Big Questions. <laughs> now this week the Dutch held a general election. Uh, Hurt Wilders' far-right party of freedom won 20 seats and was only beaten by the centre-right People's Party led by Prime Minister Mark Rutte, which gained 33 seats. But Mr Rutte had to emulate some of the populist sentiments espoused by Mr Wilders to secure his victory. And next month, the Front National's leader Marine Le Pen's anti-immigration and anti-Muslim ideas will be put to the test in the French presidential elections. Polls predict she will go through to the second round in May. And in September, alternative for Deutschland, the German far right will challenge Mrs Merkel's reign as Chancellor. Populist parties and policies have been gaining ground here too, with the Brexit vote and in Wales, UKIP's seven seats in the Welsh Assembly. The idea that ordinary people have been exploited by a privileged liberal elite seems to have taken hold across the continent. But is that about to change? Are Europe's powerless taking control? David uh, Goodhart, I must say, you've written a very interesting book about this, David. That's, well, that's a plug over. OK. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you can... Uh, you can um, uh, expand some of the ideas in it. This is the, the dispossessed, isn't it? The ignored, the neglected, the marginalised, the powerless, kicking back. What are they kicking back against? Well, I think that's true, although we should remember that not a single populist party is in, actually in government across Europe, unless you include Poland and Hungary, as some people do. Uh, but I think populism does represent a, 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 I mean, at least a partly a legitimate reaction to the over-domination of our politics by um, a quite a large group of people, um, most of them perfectly, perfectly decent people. In my book, I call them the anywheres as opposed to the somewheres. They tend to be highly educated. They tend to be quite mobile. They tend to favour openness because it tends to benefit them. And they have dominated all the political parties educated. in Britain. Highly educated, you know, been to, a, been to a good university and so on. And they have dominated the political agenda to an extraordinary extent. If you think of the huge expansion of higher education itself and the much less good options for people that don't take the university path. Do you think of the so-called knowledge economy and the disappearance mm. of all those kind of middle status jobs that, that lots of people used to enjoy and, and that, that uh, are not there so much? If you think of, of, of large-scale immigration, you think of fr how freedom of movement, people can take advantage of it if they're highly educated. You're a lawyer, you go and work in Berlin for a few years, you're, you don't feel threatened by it at home. If you're a production worker in food manufacturing, one-third, 120,000, mm. one-third of all people working in food manufacturing now come from Eastern Europe. That's just happened in the last 10 years. You, you, f you see it as competition. You see it as a threat. What about the social and agenda, social progress that has happened? Uh, you know. oh, I mean, most of the people that I call the some somewheres go along with that. I mean, they, I, I think one has to think of that there is what one might call, some people would think it a contradiction in terms, something I call decent populism. People who have, if you look at the huge liberalisation in British society since the, the early 80s on race, on gender, on sexuality, mm -hmm. most be, the vast majority of people in this country, including the more, more settled, communitarian, rooted somewhere people, go along with all those changes. And I think you, that you see that expressed through the different kinds of populism we have. I think there is, there is some pretty hardcore authoritarian populism represented by the Wilders Party. You know, they're extreme anti Islamic agenda. Then you've got much more kind of mainstream and decent populists. I would include UKIP in that. Uh, but the argument now is about how we kind of how we give somewheres a bigger legitimate voice. They they feel and have been to some extent excluded from the political agenda. The real argument now is, I think, amongst the people that run society still, which is which is the anywhere class, about 20, 25 percent of the population. And you can see an argument going on now between those who say my God, we've screwed up here. We've really got this wrong. Uh, you know, we have not been representing the views and interests of a large part of our population. 
Uh, and those who say, no, you know, these are the barbarians, mm -hmm. you know, we must double down. But there's also an agenda of buying off the, the votes of those the people. Well, it's on the their outcome agendas. of that yeah. debate that the whole future yeah. of politics depends on. Well, let's, you, you mentioned UKIP, John Rees. Uh, who are the ordinary people that have been left behind? What do they think? What do they believe? And why are they very often antipathetic to the liberal consensus? Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, because the intelligentsia, the elite, liberal, highly educated people who think they represent the ordinary people and who often campaign vociferously, vociferously uh, to, to help ordinary people, frankly, don't understand the ordinary people. You do? Uh, I, I honestly believe that UKIP is most in touch with the ordinary people, and I think that was proven on the 23rd of June last year. You know, you had a situation, Nikki, where on the 22nd of June, three quarters of our allegedly you know, representative um, you, you know, elected people in Parliament came out in favour of remaining in the European Union. And then the next day, uh, we proved quite clearly that the majority of people in this country want Britain to rule itself. Your leader got kicked in the backside in Stoke. Oh, oh yes, no, absolutely. Yeah. Right. That, that's obvious. So what do the because, people believe? Yeah. How, would, how yeah. would you characterise the beliefs of the ordinary people okay. which okay. are at odds with the liberal elite? What okay. do they believe? What do they think? Okay. They want to be able to be you know, left alone, to work hard, to support their families, to run their own country, to, to not be interfered with by you know, um, you know, foreign agendas. Uh, the, the ordinary British person um, respects other nations, is friendly to foreigners coming here, um, wants to treat people decently, but believes that our elected representatives whose salaries they pay and who they elect have a primary responsibility, a moral responsibility, to look after the interests primarily of the people of this country and not the people of other countries. Pfizer, do you want to come in here? Yeah, look, I'd agree that there's, there's a disconnect between um, an, a, a political elite and um, everyone else, and I think that's happened over years. But the answer to that isn't to say, oh, they're wrong, they're right, or this, this division that's happening between the metropolitan elite mm. and everyone else. It's to say, actually, what's underlying that isn't um, just, just an understanding of immigration and what's happening there, but also just in economic anxiety. Mm. What's happened is that you call a liberal elite and they've focused on a progressive agenda in terms of gay marriage and equality, which is a good thing, but they've ignored issues of economic inequality. They've ignored the fact that, you know, they're continuously cutting taxes for corpor on, on corporations. Mm. They are, you know, public spending cuts that are hitting the poorest most. Let me ask you this, though. Why have some people who are uncomfortable with the changes in our society, why are they uncomfortable? Why haven't they adapted? Why haven't they gone on with the general flow? Why there is, not? There is no general flow. Uh, let Pfizer, do you want to answer that? I think... There's, some, there's part of that story that we don't hear. So there is some people that are uncomfortable, and I think we need to have that conversation. And What's we the conversation need we need to have? Why, why the are The conversation about where that comes from. So when you go out and speak to people about when they say, and people will say this mm. to me, um, I'm worried about immigration, I think that's taking my job. What would you say to is them? That, is that understanding why that is. My, my answer to that is like, okay, tell me about your workplace, what has happened. Tell me about your neighbourhood, what has happened. Um, and... Sometimes there isn't a story of immigration and sometimes there is and there is a concern about resources and there is a concern of jobs But very often it's oh um, These people are coming and they're undercutting wages But when you look at who is allowing that undercutting to happen, it's the bosses So it's a misplaced anger. So what happens are is that you're blaming immigra immigrants and you it's, it's that that story not really been heard about the bosses We're not you know, it was the bankers that crashed the economy, mm. right? We have to remember why all of this stuff has happened and it's because of, of an elite a Economic liberal elite not just a progressive yeah. John, you'll come back in here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know Let's say you've got a company Okay, and you're competing in your industry against your competitors and you have um, the situation where the government has allowed our labour market to be massively oversaturated and that's driven down wages and you've got to compete. You want to drop your operating costs. You may be the most patriotic person in the country, but from a business perspective, it's impossible to deliberately pay more uh, to employ a, a local person than someone who's come in from abroad. Now, the fact is, if the government had a policy that said, look, we're going to control immigration, we're not going to oversaturate the jobs market, we're going to allow uh, wages to uh, rise Lowest unemployment for 42 years in this country at the moment. So, so, well, yeah, the, the situation... I'm, 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 I'm so sorry, but I didn't actually get a chance to make my point, and that is that patriotic employers who will... Patriotic employers. 
right. patriotic employers like the kind that um, Pfizer is saying are the cause of the problem by employing uh, foreigners rather than locals, if it were government policy to control migration, they'd all be on an even playing field. Do we need and more patriotic employ employers, people. do you believe? Uh, it doesn't matter whether they're patriotic or not. The fact is you cannot blame the employer. You blame the government because they're not James, controlling migration. I think, I, think if we, I think if we look at this, we're, we're, we're setting the, the debate up in a, a relatively narrow way, but it has only one, one answer in some ways. Are, are the dispossessed taking control? No, they're not at all. They're giving more and more control over to those who have fundamentally exploited them. I mean, the election of Donald Trump in the United States of America is about many things. But is Trump going to drain the swamp? Is he going to make the circumstances better for the American worker? Or is he going to self-enrich? He's exploiting them, is he? And he's, he, he's exploitative. And what we've seen, I think what we've narrowly seen, is that when we remove political economy from the argument, when we, when we make it not about that, we, we really do constrain the circumstances of the debate. This is about... Are people being conned? I think people are very, very frustrated. They exist in a precarious existence now. There, is much, there are much greater problems that they face, and they look to the wrong arguments, they look, to, they look to the wrong causes, they look to symptoms of their exploitation. They do not look to the global financial class. Yes, sir. People have been fooled, people have been conned, people are being, conned. People are being exploited. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what what, uh, with people like this gentleman here... You can put your hand um, down, now you're on. Sorry? You can put your hand down, now you're yeah, on. Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, couple of, a couple of years ago, a, a Tory MP was, uh, was sacked, more or less, for calling somebody a pleb. And uh, I wonder why these people that are just talking like this just don't call us plebs, because I'm a populist. Um, I'm an older person. Um, the way that people talk uh, like this is if we've lived some through some, uh, I've lived some through some halcyon world for the last 50 years of my life um, since I started voting, and it just hasn't been like that. This, um, this intelligentsia, these politicians, they've led us down roads from the very beginning. It started in '64 when I voted to join the common market, and I was told to pack a lies then. Um, it carried on with Harold Wilson further on, uh, the pound in your pocket when the pound was being devalued. Whizzing through to now, do you still think they're lying to you? Of course they are. These people, the way they talk down to you, it is just unbelievable. And, and can uh, I just... David, yeah. on that point, David Goodhart, well, that's, that's, that's key, isn't it? That's kind of distilled how well, a lot yeah. of people feel. I, 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 th I think that's right, in a way, that, that, that the feeling that a lot of the people that run all the political parties, uh, openness of the kind that has evolved in the last... 20, 25 years or so, much more open globalisation, the European Union, freedom of movement, all of these things work for some people and don't work so well for other people. And I think what Pfizer was saying about employers, although incidentally what she was saying perfectly illustrates why we've seen the rise of populism, because people on the left have, start, have say to people, no, you don't feel that, look at this. They mm. keep wanting to change the subject, which is why so many people think that the main centre-left parties, the main left parties, do not represent their interests any longer. people on the but, right but, don't but care. This is, but you're, but you're absolutely right, right. you're right about employers. What has happened is that national social contracts, particularly in employment, have become disregarded. Do you remember the amount of money that employers spend on training in the last 20 years has fallen by one-third? Because they can just, there is a reserve army of labour they can just mm. take from continental Europe. Do you realise how many construction apprenticeships began last year? 8,000. Just 8,000. You know, we are meant to be building millions of houses. And we are not educating and training people to do it. We've moved from a situation in the 1970s where we had a trade surplus of, of over 20 million to a situation where we've now got a trade deficit of, of 5 billion. You know, to tell people that um, we aren't seeing decline, uh, that people are really, really seeing decline. But are they blaming that decline, as Pfizer says, on the international financial markets? Are they, are they blaming it on the super rich who are exploiting them? Or are they blaming... Um, the, the people close by in close We all proximity. want to buy cheap goods that made elsewhere, Pfizer, don't no, we? I agree. There's definitely been winners and losers of globalisation, and of course we should be doing something about that. But what's happened is that the story that's emerged is about um, those people that have lost turning against each other. So when we talk about the powerless, the powerless aren't just the white working class. The white working class is multiracial, mm. right? Mm. So people of colour, migrant communities are disproportionately doing those jobs, mm. cleaning, caring mm. for us, mm. and those are low-paid jobs. 
And so instead of this group being kind of coming together and saying, yeah, we want more representation, we want to make sure that policies are there to protect us so we don't have zero outcomes. But we've taken, we don't have so, much, we've taken so much out of politics. I mean, this is, this is John's point. I mean, at, at, at my think tank, Policy Exchange, we're doing a whole inquiry into the growth of technocracy. So many things have been taken out of the democratic conflict, you know, whether it was the European Union itself, or the independence of central banks, the, the, the more activist judiciary. People feel that, you know, the, and technocrats are inevitably anywhere people, mm -hmm. people with the, with the instincts of the highly educated, the preferences of the highly educated. And, and this is narrow democracy, and, and, and people are saying, we want some of it back. We, we mentioned Trump earlier. What, what is it mm -hmm. that yeah. you do, like do, about do, Donald yeah. Trump? Okay, well, well do, do you know, the fact is that... Um, what you said is absolutely correct. I'd like to correct. ask you about yes, Donald yes, yes, Trump. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm answering that question. What she said is correct. What Pfizer said is correct. OK, we're not looking at the real enemy and we're arguing amongst ourselves. Do you know what organisations like Gideon's educates Britain about is the fact that there's a, a massive inequality. And I've, I've read a couple of his white papers. And um, what they teach, essentially, is that one of the causes of a reduction in employment is the kind of auto automated uh, tendency. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I, this is about Trump. OK. Right. Um, and, and so the, the automated tendency He has tendency an automated tendency. Find, yeah. OK, look. Yeah. You, you, well, what is okay, it you like okay, about him? We I, haven't I got a lot you, of time. I will but tell I, you, tell because, me now. because he wants to deregulate. OK. Mm. We, we all think, oh, dear. You know, if you take away regulations, you're harming the people who can't help themselves. It's nonsense. You take away regulations and you give small businesses the opportunity to, to compete on an equal Does footing. He with... represent the ordinary oh, man look, and look, woman look, in the Rust He's Belt fighting for America. them because he knows how to make he's money. He's fighting for them. He knows the how to blue, create jobs. Blue-collar billionaire. Listen, you don't... Exactly. You don't have to like the guy, OK? You don't have to like him, but you have to acknowledge he knows how to create jobs. Okay? He knows how to he knows lose how to money pretty effectively Michael, as well. He, he Michael's over does. here. Go on. Yeah. So I don't think Trump's solutions are, are very promising. So it seems like the situation we've got is we have um, international economies, international ecologies, and we have national politics and so the kind of the, the, there's one camp is to be uh, is to make things at the level of the nation state to kind of just do, sort of to, to re uh, return power to politics and this is kind of the trumps and the ukips of the world but that doesn't seem very successful because that's i mean the power no longer is there so trump's solution about opening coal mines again and and de-automating is just like that's the past and not the future so it looks like if we want to be doing things which actually allow us to have a better tomorrow, no, we need to be audience. more inventive and imaginative in our thinking. Yeah, OK. Um, gentleman there. Yeah, hello. I think people like Trump uh, and Theresa May, to an extent, uh, in, in this country, uh, I think Theresa May has seen um, an opportunity with a very weak um, uh, opposition uh, in the, the Labour Party. The votes have been hemorrhaged in a way to UKIP. And I think she's trying to take over the reins from UKIP. So I don't think... She's actually, um, lots of her rhetoric, I think, is more about uh, trying to increase the Tory vote um, rather than what is good for the dispossessed or the people that we're talking about. She talks about the today. just about managing, doesn't she? Black T-shirt, good morning. Hi there, good morning. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, sort of misplaced anger, and I, and I agree with those sorts of sentiments. Um, but how do we deal with this? Um, we've heard a lot of this, you, you get all these facts and figures or alternative facts or fake news as they, they're so-called banded round. But how do you deal with it? Well, I'm a teacher yeah. and I think the absolute key to this is to get young people to think critically about what they're hearing or what they're seeing. I brought some of my students here today um, and that's what we do. We get them to think critically so they're resilient to some of these so-called facts and figures. Vital lesson, isn't them. it? Absolutely. Ashley, have people... <laughs> Um, have people been lied to? Well, I think that we should trust people to, to be able to think critically about what they're, what they're being told. But I think that this idea that really the solution is education, that, that somehow if we just educated children to be able to see through the, the, the other side, which is all lies, and our side, which is the truth, then we're going to solve all these problems. But I think the point that you made is really, really important. That we've actually depoliticized a huge range of what used to be the bread and butter of politics. That, you know, um, a, an older sort of left-wing idea was that, you know, any cook can govern. That, that th there's this idea that, that politics is something, that, that uh, and economics is something that everyday people can understand and should be able to understand. And instead, we sort of outsource those questions to technocrats. And that's not enough for people anymore. Um, and and, and instead of understanding that. that, the left has kind of doubled down and said, you know, um, 
um, you know, the conversation is really about symbolic things and it's really yeah. about language and that sort of thing and, and it's sort of not speaking to everyday people. No, I, I would and, completely agree with that. I think we, that a lot of these yeah. questions and economics and politics is made, it, it's, it's been siphoned away from people and we're not having that conversation enough and I'd agree again about the lack of representation mm -hmm. among our MPs from people from working class backgrounds that don't have degrees, that are, you know, um, black communities are heavily un un underrepresented mm -hmm. in um, government. So, I, you know, I think we're agreeing on that point but my point is that this narrative of divide and rule of, of you know blaming the immigrants is not helping us and that it's an mm -hmm. important yeah. critical but, but isn't, isn't it a point Pfizer we need as to well? be thinking about how we come together we need it, leaders mm -hmm. to be isn't telling it a point the on the left the left would say oh Syriza good Podima good UKIP bad it, because it's the wrong sort of populism you know it's all populism isn't it yeah look I don't I don't speak for the left, the left is a lot of different people, as is as is the right. Um, and yeah. I mean, my point is is that we we don't have the political leaders, unfortunately, that will come forward and really tell us the story of how we can work. And we do work. This is the thing. This is the world you don't see. You know, actually, working class people are growing up together. We're going to school together. People are marrying each other. Actually, that's not just some liberal elite thing. That isn't. We're seeing that in working class communities as well. For the most part, we're getting it's on it's really David, well. David, but it's about partly. Of it's about pace of change. I mean, the, the, and the, those people who feel comfortable with change because they're, they, they have achieved identities, they've done well at school, they have, they have successful careers, and they can deal with it. And a lot of people see rapid change as, as a kind of loss. And I think what kind of change are they seeing? Not just well, economically, just, social change? Oh yeah, most of this is non-material. This is not so much about uh, about material things. It's about about no longer, you know, having bit, feeling that you're valued by your society. As I say, because all the value has gone on the cognitive elite. You know, people who do who do well surely, at, and pass exams and so surely. on. Surely, but it's also about group attachments. I mean, the anywhere people don't feel group attachments, they don't place such a high value. You know, on, on national citizenship and so on, because they don't need it so much. But, but sure lots of people, it's, sure it's, it's part of you know the security and familiarity that that, that, that people want. And group identities are. Is this generational? Because disproportionately older no, people voted for I mean, Brexit. No, it's not to some extent, but I think. Yeah. Well, I, I surely, think, I think James I, Treadwell. Surely it's surely it's about yeah. surely it's about both. But I think one of the things we're saying here, we're, we're having these we're having these old comparisons of, of left and right. For example, one of the things about the left, the political left and the right, is how close together they have become. Where is the political representation from what would have been the old side of the left to say, actually, what we need is we need national investment. We don't need necessarily austerity. We need a different set of, you know, even now to represent old style social democracy and, and welfareism is, is made out as if it's sort of North Korean. Um, no, it, no, it, no it, that's it, not true at all. There's it, been a much more the, convergence on economic There's factors. been an absolute a, convergence that oh. makes neoliberalism and, and neoliberal capitalism the only only economic system that can Is there a way back yeah. for the 40 per cent state? It's not neoliberalism. Even where this investment has happened, <coughs> you know, it hasn't necessarily connected to the people who should have been benefited from it. And, and that's why I think Pfizer <coughs> is absolutely right. It's the level of understanding that our politicians, our policymakers have of meeting the needs of the people that they're, they're serving. Last and, word. And, and I think there's, you know, there's some real issues for us to be grappling with, with there now, and in particular, people don't like change, the changes that are coming in mm. the future. Well, uh, Tony Blair was on the Andrew Marr programme this morning. Is it a way back for the Blairite Centre? Hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. If you have something to say about that debate, log on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions. Follow the link to where you can join in the discussion online. Contribute on Twitter. We're also debating live this morning in Cardiff. Does a nation's happiness matter? And does forgiving set you free? Get tweeting or emailing on those topics now. Send us any other ideas or thoughts you may have about the programme. Well, tomorrow, yes, it's International Happiness Day. Don't worry. Being happy is not being made compulsory yet. Uh, but governments are increasingly interested in measuring their nation's happiness levels and probing why some countries are happier than others. Denmark tops the league table of the happiest countries. The UK is 23rd out of 157, uh, beaten by Scandinavians. Uh, sounds like the football list, doesn't it? Beaten by the Scandinavians, the Dutch, Austria, Germany, Belgium, Ireland, uh, the North Americans, even some South American countries, but they were happier than France. Uh, they came 32nd, and the UK itself has happiness high and low spots, with the Welsh borough of Blaenau Gwent here in South Wales having one of the biggest gaps between people 
who are content and unhappy. Liverpool, Sunderland and Rotherham, similarly miserable. Does it matter? Well, researchers have found that the regions in Britain with the highest well-being inequality were more likely to have voted for well-being inequality, more likely to have voted for Brexit. Does a nation's happiness matter? Some link to our first debate. Uh, Michael, what, what are you talking about, well, happiness? What? I mean, you said earlier on when we were having a cup of tea, it's positive, conscious state, yeah? Yeah, so I think the easiest way to understand happiness is just anything which feels good to you and unhappiness is anything which feels bad. So elation and contentment are different types of positive states mm -hmm. and then something like anger and fear are um, a different kinds of uh, sort of uh, unhappy states. But we all have those at different times of the day. I like, you know, I like being with my family, walking my dog, playing my guitar, all that stuff. That's, that make, makes me happy. Yeah. But when I'm playing my guitar, the rest of their family are not happy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I think we should be looking at uh, how to maximise happiness overall, <laughs> how, to, how to give everyone the... Uh, how do you do that? Well, I mean, that's a slightly... Uh, I mean, wh wh where we can really start is by Big trying question. to understand um, what happiness is and, and, and how it works. So uh, the kind of the standout fact from the happiness literature, so we've, we've been collecting data on happiness for the last 60 years, <laughs> and the, uh, the most kind of surprising thing is that happiness hasn't increased. So people's self-reports of how satisfied they are with their lives have not increased across the whole of the developed hasn't world. Hasn't decreased as well. Hasn't, hasn't increased. So I mean, it's, it's, gone, it's been bumbling yeah, along it's, about it's, seven. It's stayed it? flat. So, yeah. so this is despite the fact that we're so we're fine. We're much richer, but we're also much healthier. We live longer. Mm -hmm. We're, despite what you might read in the Daily Mail, we are safer than ever before. <laughs> um, we have better technology. So we have everything which we think should make life better, apart from happiness. And that should ask us. Uh, that, that's just going to prompt us to ask some questions about what's going on, what causes happiness, and what do we do about it. Ashley. <laughs> they get the government are taking this seriously, mm -hmm. aren't they? They're setting up think tanks, they're going into schools, they're talking about getting mindfulness mm -hmm. into schools. All good? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, it sounds really good, and that's part of the reason why we're talking about it right now. I mean, who's going to say, no, we should make everybody miserable, you know? <laughs> no one's going to say that. But I find it very interesting. I could almost, like, tick boxes of the sorts of claims that these people make. Um, indeed, I sort of wrote a book about the claims that these people make. And why, why have they become so powerful, and why are they made in the, in the same ways over and over? So you've just said one of those, which is what I call the sort of so-called paradox of prosperity. So you talk about happiness levels have stayed the same in spite of increased technology, all these things that should make us happy and increased wealth and so on. But then they never actually say, in spite of the fact that in the United States, blacks can drink out of the same water fountain, still no happier. Um, in spite of the fact that women have more freedom than ever before, still no happier. Right? They don't make that argument. Why not? Why do we always choose those few particular things? And I think that it reflects the fact that we've um, we haven't got a sort of positive vision for society anymore. We're sort of disoriented from those things that used to be, you know, like wealth, generalizing wealth for the population is going to sort of set people free. Mm -hmm. That was something that both the left and the right sort of used to agree on. It was sort of like the disagreement was could capitalism deliver the goods? And now it's really difficult to think of a left-wing position that sees wealth in a positive way. And so that whole paradox of prosperity becomes a sort of bipartisan thing that most people can agree on. But actually, it's really problematic because, first of all, it, um, it, it, it sort of depends on this Lamarckian view of happiness, right? Like Acquired my, characteristics. Yeah, my parents got an 8 on the happiness scale, so right? So I was it. born in yeah. the 80s, so I should be a 9, right? Yeah. No, absolutely not. Everybody sort of is born into a particular world that's new to them and so on. You don't sort of build on the happiness level. GDP levels. got something to do with it. The and, and general exactly, wealth of the nation. Yeah, so the wealth use, of nations. But we they'll get use GDP. GDP. Sorry? We get over-obsessed with GDP. <laughs> and I think it was back in the 60s, Robert Kennedy said, you know, GDP measures every everything mm -hmm. except the things that make our existence worthwhile and I think so it's we, not a big screen TV so, it's a walk in the forest well I think it's a whole range of things and what we try to do in, in sort of uh, uh, when we're constructing policy is we try to compartmentalize and people don't exist in silos they don't exist in in, in, in categories people's lives are diverse and there are a whole range of different things that make you happy so um, and, and the impact on the quality of your life and so by just our kind of um, almost uh, you know obsessive focus on on GDP or GVA being the, the thing that we need to increase, the, the numbers go up and everyone's going to be happy. Of course, you know, 
it is about the economy stupid, but it's not only about the but economy. But this is the stupid. thing: is that there's this mm -hmm. disorientation toward what that actually means, and actually it reflects a sort of depoliticization of economics and the economic realm. And it's sort of saying, oh, you know, leave that up to the technocrats. You know, you worry about your family and your little microcosm and oh, all that icky but money. But actually, GDP really does matter. And people are sort of trying to deflect attention from that. Well, when the economy doesn't grow at a sufficient rate, who pays? Of course, it but matters. That but it's not the only thing that matters, is it? because um, people have a huge range of different things going on in, in, in their lives and how can we construct public policy which recognises those nuances rather than obsessing over one thing? Oh, uh, Gideon, I'll bring you in here because it, it, does, it does strike me that uh, it's an impossible dream, isn't it? Because something that makes one person content or one group of part of society content is going to make another pretty grumbly. Isn't it? I mean, if you, if you limit the use of motor cars, for example, a lot of environmentalists would say, yes, get in there. Uh, but uh, people trying to get to work, people on the school run, petrol heads would be very, very irascible. Indeed. Thank well, you very much. Your, right, uh, over here. <laughs> Sorry, that was the longest question in the history of questions. What would you like to say? I was hoping we would actually stick to your guitar playing. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, it links into what was just going on there. We, we, on the one hand, we can think about GDP, a very big picture measure of how a society is doing. On the other hand, we can think about the distribution of happiness within it. And they're mutually contradictory, and, if you can. And, and in many ways they are. And when you, uh, you began by talking about Denmark, for example, yeah. routinely top of the world happiness index. What is it about Denmark that we don't have? Well, there are two big things about Denmark that Britain doesn't have. Go on. One is more income inequality. In other words, Denmark is one of the most equal countries in the world, right? So when you're talking about happiness yeah. in Denmark, you're talking about something which is, you can reliably say people have a stake in. And secondly, a tradition of thinking about public goods and about the kind of society that they are, which is much more collectivist than ours has now become, right? So what, is, what, is, what does Denmark have? It has a way of thinking about a shared project, which it's, it's not trouble-free, it doesn't iron out all your difficulties, but it does mean that it's a bit more meaningful to talk about happiness in Denmark because it's not something which seems to be so unequally distributed in society that one person's happiness is very likely to be the expense of somebody else's, which is what you so often find. And Blinder Gwent, why are people mm -hmm. feeling like they've been left behind or that they're getting a raw deal? It's because they live in a society, firstly, where there are huge disparities in wealth between them and the people at the other end of the scale, and they know this, they experience it. Secondly, there's a, a very poor public conversation about that. There's, there's very Do, little sense... This is about coveting there. what other people have, then? Uh, it's... Happiness will always be comparative. Yeah. It'll feel relative, won't it? You'll be, you'll be happier in a society where you feel like you have, you're, you're in the same game as everybody else. But if you see else somebody is. else who's not in the same it, game, it's not about envy, all of a sudden, though, that it, happiness is disrupted. It's, it's not about mm -hmm. coveting, it's not about envy. Yeah. It's just about inevitably but feeling that your own deal is shared by other isn't people. It's also about a society that places a huge amount of emphasis on your individual success it's being indeed. tied to your place in the consumer marketplace. So, you, you know, if you fail to have the latest items, you are a failed person. You, 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 you don't have a value and and actually that creates a sort of uh, a, a continuing nagging dissatisfaction for people that they they continually yeah. feel that I don't think that that's a problem though why see the thing no, is that we're prob that, we problematize, problem. we problematize the dissatisfaction we problematize the feelings and what I often see from happiness people is they'll they'll quote Karl Marx Karl Marx has this line where he says a house may be great or small but as long as the other houses are likewise small it satisfies all requirements for a residence but let there arise next to the house a a castle and all of a sudden the house shrinks to a hut yeah. and people go oh isn't that terrible isn't it amazing that we can imagine Karl Marx saying don't covet what the rich have actually he was saying that castle shows you what's being kept from you that's yours go out and take it you probably built it I love that expression the happiness people that you use. Sorry, these sort of <laughs> self-help happiness experts. More from the happiness people <laughs> in just a moment we got to, and also I want to hear from the the, the mis what, where would we be with that sadness as well? We'd have no art. Where would Morrissey be He'd have no, <laughs> if we'd have no back cannon? Yeah, Liz, uh, I know you want to talk here because you work in companies, don't you, to try and get people to focus on well-being, on contentment, on happiness. What do you do? Well, I might be accused of being part of this happiness people thing, but I would absolutely strongly agree with this whole idea about the fact that GDP or a focus on economic growth per se, nothing wrong with economic growth. We need economic growth when growth is needed. There's a brilliant economist who said, um, we have an economy that grows whether or not we thrive, and we need an economy that thrive, that where we thrive whether or not it grows. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that shift. It's a small shift. It feels like a small shift, but actually it's huge, because at the moment, every 
everything we do, whether it's health, economy, uh, the public sector, the private sector, everything else, is all judged on whether or not it contributes to economic growth. Now, in some spaces, we need economic growth. In Blind I Gwent, there are people there who desperately need us to grow the economy in ways that benefits them. Mm. But we need to shift that economy to say, we should all be judging ourselves and each other and our businesses and our p politicians by whether or not they're doing the sorts of things that help us to thrive as individuals and as communities. It's not an individual thing. It's not a community thing. It's an everybody thing. Yeah. We need to make that shift, and that will support a lot of people. Gideon, there are people who think this is a load of, oh, careful what word I use here, <laughs> uh, baloney. They think it's all a bit mind-numbing. But th this is great. If this can raise our general contentment to Denmarkian levels, not Lamarckian, Denmarkian levels, that's a good thing. Sounds like it, and I, I broadly I, I would agree. I think we've got to be very careful about how simple we think that is, though, because there's so many trade-offs yeah. involved in this kind of thing. So often yeah. what we do to promote one group's happiness will be at the expense of another. And I think we need to front up to that rather than thinking that well-being is just this kind of fluffy thing that we all necessarily get just by talking about and it. I'm, I'm, it's, not a, it's not a fluffy thing. It's not a fluffy it's, thing. It's, it's not a fluffy thing. I think what it recognises... Comments from the audience on fluffy things and happiness, <laughs> people, in just it, a second. Put your hands up, please. I'll come what to it you. recognises yeah. is that, you know, and, and actually we have a piece of legislation in, in Wales which, which um, recognises well-being. We don't talk about happiness per se, but happiness and well-being, I would say, was kind of intrinsically linked. So we have a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And what that requires us to do when we think about the decisions that we take is think about the social, economic, environmental and cultural implications of the decisions that Multifaceted. we take. Multifaceted. So you can actually put that in public policy making terms. Of course you can't legislate to make people's inner being happy. You can't what can legislate you, what do you to, want to do, that, to you do can't... that. But you can take decisions in a way which aren't which aren't well, what do you want to do that you can't do now that would make us all happier we, we, so we could if, be the happiness if, people. If, if you think about the way that we um, construct towns and, and villages are we going to do that in a way which are going to build a whole load of you know concrete monstrosities which don't have access to public space which don't facilitate kind of community interaction and engagement and um, which don't have um, uh, uh, environmentally friendly mm. public transport links and so on and so on or are we going to construct them in a way which actually thinks about all of those different facets facets and how they will relate back to people's well-being people's happiness so that's just one example well, of that's where they were doing when they built Milton Keynes really thinking very, very yeah, that, that lady back there in the back row it's, it's, it's great to be in Wales Wales, though, a fellow Celtic country, because a lot of us Celts are not happy unless we're sad. You've got to... <laughs> I, the one thing good for, morning. For, for, for good morning. Are you for, one of the happiness people? Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a pragmatist, I'm yeah. a realist, and yeah. whilst people haven't got employment, while people don't have food on the table, while people don't feel safe, yeah. while people have no meaning in their life, um, when communities are destroyed and we're into third, fourth generations And we look at people starving in East Africa. Well, yeah. you go to Blind and Gwent and actually they're the food, the food banks, mm, yeah. Cardiff, mm. um, you look all over South Wales and we are living, the austerity is biting really yeah. hard. And <laughs> so it's great, you can't have happiness, you just can't have happiness if your fundamental basic human needs are not yeah. being met and that is a political issue. Okay. Yeah. What about, yeah, oh, this John Rees Evans, you know? what about this yeah. whole idea about people feeling that they're stifled? Yeah. I know guys like you say political yes. correctness has gone mad. Yes, yes, I think it has. Has it? I mean, and what, what do you my, mean by my that? Point is, I'll tell you what really concerns me about this conversation, Nikki, and that is that we're looking at circumstances as the cause of whether or not people are happy. I think circumstances are important, but I think something which is much more important is relationships. Now, I know, I know of somebody who has said that if he divorced his wife, he'd be three and a half grand better off each year. And I think it's incredibly upsetting to me. It, OK, and this is because of government benefits and whatever. You know, legislation doesn't really do anything to encourage people to stay married. You know, the, the traditional values of this country are what I believe have been responsible for our success, our, our prosperity. You know, family Marriage breakup. Marriage is the only relationship family, that makes happiness. Well, you know, or, that, that, or is it that, 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 relationships? That is a, that is a typical relationship that most people can identify with. What's well, a typical relationship that most people can identify with? Than, uh, okay, marriage. I mean, most, most people are familiar with the concept of marriage. Now, I don't want to go down some line of what is a legitimate relationship. The fact is, I believe that having positive relationships, having healthy relationships, is what makes us happy primarily. Circumstances come a distant second. And so I have a little bit of a 
difficulty with the definition of happiness when we are talking about essentially a positive feeling, an averaged out positive feeling, you know, over a long period of time, I could understand. But a lot of the time, maintaining relationships requires us to, to do things which don't particularly feel good, like doing our duty, for example, working late at night to make sure we, we finish a project so that we can it's succeed. That, isn't it, for us, a families. traditional marriage, the bedrock of society, and you know, we'd all... <laughs> We all. I, I thought you might yeah, respond like that. <laughs> the relationship, relationships are obviously very important yeah. and do really affect our happiness at an individual level. And what I would say about this, the kind of well-being literature and actually taking that alongside measures of economic growth, is that it reminds us what it's all for. I think sometimes, very often, like policymakers forget what it's all for. Like it's not just about just growing, and it's not just about a, se a segment of the population getting more and more money. It's about thinking overall what's happening and are we creating the right environment for people, all people. Yeah. to flourish and be happy and have the chance of happiness. Well, could... Jane, last, last, last word, uh, Michael, sorry. Um, <laughs> are you happy with that debate? Is that, is it more right <laughs> so I think, I think it shows some of the things which uh, yeah. are kind of significant. So there's this, there's this sort of, there's this uh, a thought that uh, if you focus on happiness, that means you're not caring about uh, misery in people's lives. Stepford and... Wives is the sort of Yeah, idea, but actually, uh, the, 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 exactly the point of the uh, of what the well-being literature is supposed to shine a light on is which things are actually the really important determinants of happiness. So yeah. you actually get a story about how interpersonal relationships are really important. You get a story about uh, how unemployment is a huge driver of, uh, of unhappiness. So, so GDP growth less important, but unemployment is really, really significant. Open spaces, countryside. Yeah, open spaces. But the, I mean, the thing which actually comes out most significantly is is not the material things. It's uh, it's not even the kind of the interpersonal relationships. It's actually um, it's mental health and sort of our relationships with ourselves. Mm. No uh, subtle sidestepping of anything mm. to do with what she's actually talking about. When she's talking about actual material problems, that's the danger of this discourse: is that it redefines inequality as essentially a subjective thing. And that and, no. is the debate. <laughs> over. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. You can join in all this morning's debates by logging on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions. Follow the link to the online discussion. You can tweet using the hashtag BBCTBQ. Tell us what you think about our last uh, big question too. Does forgiving set you free? If you'd like to apply to be in the audience at a future show, please do email audience tbq at menton.tv. Oxford next week, Brighton April the 2nd, and Cambridge the week after that. Well, some of you may have heard or seen Thordis Elva and Tom uh, Stranger discussing their book, South of Forgiveness, on radio and TV this week. During a teenage romance in 1996, Tom, then 18, raped 16-year-old uh, Thordis. Now, Right now, they both want people to understand the shame, blame, silence and suffering they each went through and the difference forgiveness, decades later, has brought to each of them. Does forgiving set you free? But Natalie, could you forgive, in that sense, in that way, somebody who has raped you? I think... The first thing is, it's interesting in your introduction there, you said about the shame and the pain they both went through, which immediately says that the pain of the rapist and the pain of the person who's been raped are yeah. equal and are something mm. we should be caring about equally it's when one of them has yeah. inflicted that on another. And yeah. so I think we have to be aware of that. And I think the extraordinary thing actually about their story and the reason it's got airtime is sadly not because of the story of Thordis and what she's done and, and her choices. It's actually because for once a man has said, oh, I raped somebody and I is still standing up and saying that and that shouldn't be something we're applauding or calling courageous because rape is a horrific crime. Do you respect so think, him for that? No, I, I, I don't because he's a rapist and we shouldn't mm. really respect rapists. Yeah. Um, so I think um, one of the big issues is that actually for women, women are socialised to um, be forgiving, to be kind, to be caring and to not have anger. And I think one of the things that's really liberating for women is anger and rage and fearness. Mm. fierceness. But what I would say is, and I... Um, um, that actually my personal experience is that I did forgive. Um, you were in an abusive me. relationship. Um, right, yes, right, and right. I um, forgive. You did forgive. What, forget, um, why and how? Well, and I think I, the reason that I want to talk about rage and anger is that I think that firstly, women are not given access or permission to rage and anger. And so I think that we can't, I think that we're socialised into having to forgive and we're socialised into saying that's what you should do and that actually we see women who forgive or are kind or are loving as a better class of women. And that's kind of how this story has panned out um, in terms of Thordis Elva and Tom Stranger. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was a long journey to forgiveness and that it's not a model that I want to put out there and say, right, 
sides. Forgiveness is the way that we solve this, because for forgiveness can be liberating, but actually forgiveness can be a tool or a weapon. And I think for the majority of women, it becomes a weapon to further perpetuate the suffering that they've been subjected to. Um, but I do think lib it can be liberating. My experience is that it's been liberating, but I wouldn't want to make it a, um, a model for how we do life. Tell me about like. your experience. What does it mean, in your experience, to forgive? Do you actually communicate that forgiveness to the other person or is it are you internalizing something about now i will move on and i will deal with it in a certain way yeah so if i'd firstly say that when i was with my ex-husband um i thought forgiveness meant accepting whatever he did to me and just forgetting it and trying to move on and, and accept his behavior really because then he was going to change and if i just love him enough it will change and i think for a lot of women that's the journey they've been on and that they've been socialized into by society and actually forgiveness for me really understanding forgiveness started by owning how terrible what he'd done to me was over a period of four years and saying this is horrendous and this is going to affect me for the rest of my life and being starting to make visible the the full pain of that because actually forgiveness is often a form of denial um, as they say denial isn't just a river in Egypt is it <laughs> and um, I think actually what we need to be looking at is a much more longer term thing so for me forgiveness is not nullifying the consequences of someone's behavior towards me there are consequences it's not a transactional thing it's not about me communicating to him that okay. he's forgiven mm. it's about me choosing to not hate him and to not wish him harm but I'll also to put safeguards in place to prevent him further hurting me. Finn, you're nodding. Do you agree with that? Um, could well, you, I, I mean, could you forgive somebody in the same way that Thordis has, that we, we saw on television, heard on the radio this week? The, the story of Thordis Alva is her own personal, individual journey. And she states that that, in some ways, has helped her to feel free, uh, more free. I suppose I'm also interested in how we can free the whole of society from epidemic levels of male violence against women and children. An estimated 80,000 rapes every year, over 400,000 sexual assaults, two women every week in this country murdered by a violent male partner. Now, forgiving, it is about self-help. It's a journey of self-help. And I, th I think we should support women to do that and to feel in control of themselves and their lives. I don't agree with scrutinising women even more than they're already scrutinised. But as well as self-help, we need societal help. We need to heal the problems and fractures in society that cause these horrendous crimes in the first place. So why so is there this uh, epidemic? Why is there this epidemic, as you put it? Because women are unequal. And because men are socialised to be, have entitlement over women's bodies um, and men are socialised to, to mm. be allowed to do that and actually to be perpetuated by a wider societal structure mm. which undermines women's sense of agency, sense of okay. right over their that own bodies. That is what Tom himself said, that is what Tom Stranger said, that he felt that as a man it was a win for him, that he had a right over his girlfriend's body because he was dating her, that they'd been out on a night out, they'd been drinking alcohol together, and that he wouldn't be a proper young man if he didn't have sex with her at the end of the night. He said himself that he felt pressured. He, he said himself he didn't feel he enjoyed it greatly, but he felt that's what he was supposed to do, and also that's what he deserved, as if the body of that woman was his birthright somehow. And that was his own words. I think society... Um in some ways allows that to happen so if you, if you look at um, what are the other things that are defined as hate crime so disability hate crime race um, hate crime um, misogyny is not um, is not a hate crime mm -hmm. so on a on a daily basis I'm sure all of the women in in this audience will have um, will have encountered some form of sexism whether that's catcalling whether that's something going on in work whether that's a whole range of different things and yet there are means is it not of quite a leap from what we're talking about there are means no, of it's not okay it's, it, it, could you forgive it could you forgive a terrorist I also, I, I also believe in rehabilitation. I believe okay. in giving people chances. I, I agree with Tom Stranger speaking about what he's done. Rehabilitation, I just can I just pick up on men. that point? Because, Peter, that's what you, you, where you work, Chief Executive of the Prison Fellowship. You visit people in prisons. Yep. Uh, could you forgive someone who killed your child? <clears throat> it's a question I've asked myself a lot because I work with people who go into prison who have forgiven um, people who brutally killed their children. And um, I think of a couple, Ray and Vi, um, I meet with them They've quite often. They've been on this programme. I'm sure they have. Amazing and they people. going week after week. And somehow they have managed to go on that journey of forgiveness. And I think they do it because um, 
when we forgive, we look at the future and we say, actually, the past is the past. It does need punishing. It does need dealing with. We don't negate it. We don't say it didn't happen. But we look to the future and we say, I don't want to hold this sense of revenge in my heart. Does I don't it not want to hold this. Leave the person that you forgive, yeah. uh, let them off the hook. No, I think it does the complete opposite. It says you cannot forgive unless you first admit that something that needs forgiving has happened. And you must never minimise, you must never try and take it away, you must never say that it didn't matter in any way whatsoever. You say, yes, this is horrible, this is a horror, but yet I will still choose to forgive. But it, it, requires, it requires a degree of remorse from the individual uh, as well. Not necessarily. I think, think there is... But within a minute, Peter, it oh, sorry, requires a degree yeah. well, of remorse. I, th I, think, I think in order to, to make that step towards forgiveness, necessarily someone needs to say, you know, well, I have, I have also done something pretty spectacularly wrong here. Um, and I'm, I'm going to put my hands up to that. And I mean, as a criminologist, I come across an awful lot of offenders and not all of them are willing to do that. So I have concerns, for example, when you get governments saying, you know, we're going to force offenders to say sorry, because that mm -hmm. takes away that self-recognition that actually is about the individual. you get fake remorse? I think you do get fake remorse, yeah. I mean, some people are incredibly good at, at gaming the system. A very famous example of an Austrian serial killer, actually. He'd been convicted of murder and then came out and became... So I just missed who of, it was? Uh, um, and he was an Australian right. uh, Austrian serial killer right. um, who expressed sort of remorse, became a, a famed penal reform correspondent. Um, and then while he was doing that and talking about the level of remorse he showed, went on to kill more and more women before taking his own life. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that he, he built his reputation, at least in part, on expressing a sort of fake remorse. And that's one of the problems with remorse. It's very, very difficult to sort of subjectively get the extent to which someone really believes what they're Peter, saying. I think you have to define terms in terms of what is um, forgiveness. Um, and, and it can come in different ways. You know, in the Christian faith, you talk about divine forgiveness, somebody actually asking forgiveness um, from God, and that's freely given in terms of love. Then you have what you're talking about, which is a two-way restoring of relationship. And that's really good because that affects the other person and also perhaps give them a chance to move on in their life. But also, you can just forgive without ever talking to somebody. You know, and, that, and I think in it's a not, no, It's not transactional. It's not as transactional, we, as we I heard think, particularly with a violent relationship or mm -hmm. somebody who's been hurt very badly. That may be what's, what is the best thing to is say. Forgiveness no, is the right word for that. Is that, yeah. is that, yeah. is that really absolutely yeah. 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 It's a state for you, yeah. and it's yeah. not about the other. The yeah, other no, person. and I think, that, I, th I think that's the thing then. It, it, the, yeah. Then a recognition that that's for the individual. One of the problems I have with forgiveness is to give and receive. No, I would say reconciliation is what you're talking about. Reconciliation is when both parties come yeah. together, whereas forgiveness is about an attitude of heart to that yeah. person. Yeah, audience. Yeah. Hi, Darren. Go Hi. on. Uh, I'm a counsellor and I have a wide-ranging age group of clients, but I mainly work with children who have been victimised in some way. And the key for them to start moving forward is to recognise that the event had happened, but to no longer see themselves as a victim. Yeah. Once they've, once they've de-adopted that, that role, mm. um, then the person who carried out the act is no longer the perpetrator mm. of their status. And maybe after that, we can start looking at forgiveness if it's going to help them to uh, move on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. self-definition. Self, self the, 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 the removal of shame is, is very important because if a victim feels th mm. shame or responsibility themselves, that's, that's very sort of bad for them. So I, I totally take on board that, you know, um, uh, th there is a, a, a process that you have to necessarily go through that, that recognises that you're not responsible. But what is wrong Whether with that necessarily requires Finn. you to forgive the individual that's perpetrated Finn, that. Go on. What is so you. wrong with saying that acknowledging that somebody has been victimised. I think we need to take the stigma away from a lot of crimes and especially sexual violence. If someone can go into work one morning and say, oh my goodness, I was mugged the other week, do you remember it's going to come to court, I had X, this amount stolen, and people go, oh, that's terrible, I hope it goes all right. We wouldn't say, I'm not a victim. Nothing happens. People yes, I you know, were. You were fr victimized. Friends, of mine, friends of mine, and, and I know I deal, you know, I've been discussing this a little bit, uh, who have been sexually abused do not want to be called victims. Mm. 
Yes, yeah, there's a survivor yeah. language, I would, but I also yeah. think that we need to act, and They're people victims, do survive. survive they live horrendous. to see another day. They are survivors. But we also need to acknowledge that they're victim to a crime, and we need to start removing the stigma that surrounds that because the, the shame that women are meant to feel is part of the, the burden that they alone have to carry, which, which takes women, away what from about, their happiness. You know, what about children of whatever gender who are abused? Absolutely, uh, you know, I agree. Anthony, we heard there from Peter, who is uh, a man inspired by his faith, talking about the forgiveness of, of Jesus. Jesus forgave, didn't he? Jesus did forgive, uh, but it's far more complex than we've been saying. And Run the, it by us. And the issue isn't just a gendered issue. Uh, it seems to me that forgiveness is over generally. And, and um, m most people would quote the words of Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do and would argue that that's a great example of unilateral forgiveness. But in fact, it isn't an example of forgiveness at all. Uh, it's an example of Jesus praying for the good of those who were killing him. He didn't forgive anybody. He prayed that God, in course of time, would forgive. And although um, it, 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 it appears that um, it, it's, it's a... It's, it's a prayer that, that, that sort of lays aside uh, justice in terms of what God's doing. But divine forgiveness, as with human forgiveness, is always preceded by repentance, by a genuine sorrow that's lived out. And as has been rightly said, how do we know mm -hmm. what genuine repentance is? And there's a fantastic book by an American called F F Faking It, in which the author describes how clever people are in faking repentance. So what James was saying. Repentance has to be demonstrated, it has to be appropriate, it has to be modelled over a long period of time. And within that context, there can be uh, a movement towards forgiveness. And you yeah. mentioned justice, and I think too often people don't see justice. And if we're talking about women and children and the difficulties that they face in taking cases forward, the very low numbers we have for um, rape convictions in this country, for example, justice holds people back, not just as individuals, but the whole of society is held back by not giving social justice to people who've been victimised in these ways. How would, you increase, rape, how would you increase the number of rape convictions in this country? Well, I would improve the police. I mean, it doesn't... There's plenty of reports on this there's a culture of disbelief for a start which surrounds people who report rape um, so that needs to change there's been problems with the police no criming rate rapes the CPS doesn't take cases forward based on stereotypical judgments about women's sexuality had she been drinking what was she wearing did she know the man before we're still dealing with sort of very archetypal stereotypes okay, Ashley, about do you women's want to come sexuality in on this, this general debate <laughs> I, I've, I've just you've been listening with great interest what David will come to in a second a man who's written another very interesting book well I think that there's a an issue right now around um, moral panics around um, around rape and I, I'm, I'm Do you understand the definition of a moral panic? I, I, yeah and I'm really sorry to, to say that because I know that that's you know how do you you know co come up against something like that you know victims what do you mean so by a moral panic around it? Um, I think that there's a tendency now to um, subtly sort of, I, I don't disagree that obviously rape is a horrible thing, but there's a tendency to sort of um, make the barriers around what constitutes harassment a little bit fuzzy. And, and we sort of built up this idea that there's this huge um, epidemic of male violence, but what's being defined as male violence is a little funny. So <laughs> there, I remember that's because there is um, an epidemic of male violence. <laughs> no, it's like, not, like every, every single meant to be, I, I it's meant to be that male violence. Yeah, no, I'm supposed to, to, to be like I, really I, I, insulted I, 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 by that and that's sexual no, no. harassment. No, no, let's hear, let's, let's, wait, wait, wait. Excuse me, everybody. Excuse me. Ashley. That's why I was afraid to say anything. No. Is that, you know, I remember when I was a teenager walking down the street, you know, with the, in the days of Britney Spears the, with a tummy top, and the cars would go by and whistle at us. And I was with one of my friends, and, and, and she turns around and goes, thank you. And I said, shh, you're not supposed to like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that the, it, this it, it's a, some, a little bit of bad faith around these sorts of things, that the, it's, it's, we're supposed to be really, really offended by male attention. But actually, some women do enjoy male You've attention. You've what you're yeah. talking about, because you course. started by saying well, there's a moral panic. Well, hang on. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's, what, right. we, I, what I need to do is I'm try, I need Defining to try and get in touch with the BBC funny. and I get an extension on this debate, <laughs> <laughs> because we've just ended some fascinating territory. But unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you all very much indeed for uh, your contributions this morning.
As always, the debates continue online and on Twitter. Oxford next week. Do join us then. Thank you so much for watching here from Cardiff. This weekend, BBC... What do they believe? What do they think? OK. What, they want to be able to be you know, left alone, to work hard, to support their families, to run their own country, to, to not be interfered with by, you know, um, you know foreign agendas. Uh, the, the ordinary British person um, respects other nations, is friendly to foreigners coming here, um, wants to treat people decently, but believes that our elected representatives whose salaries they pay and who they elect have a primary responsibility, a moral responsibility to look after the interests primarily of the people of this country and not the people of other countries. Pfizer, do you want to come in here? Yeah, look, I'd agree that there's, there's a disconnect between um, an, a, a political elite and um, everyone else, and I think that's happened over years. But the answer to that isn't to say, oh, they're wrong, they're right, or this, this division that's happening between the metropolitan elite mm. and everyone else. It's to say, actually, what's underlying that isn't um, just, just an understanding of immigration and what's happening there, but also just in economic anxiety. Mm. What's happened is that you call a liberal elite and they've focused on a progressive agenda in terms of gay marriage and equality, which is a good thing, but they've ignored issues of economic inequality. They've ignored the fact that, you know, they're continuously cutting taxes for corpor on, on corporations. Mm. They are, you know, public spending cuts that are hitting the poorest most. Let me ask you this, though. Why have some people who are uncomfortable with the changes in our society, why are they uncomfortable? Why haven't they adapted? Why haven't they gone on with the general flow? There, is, there is no general flow. Uh, let Pfizer, do you want to answer that? I think... There's, some, there's part of that story that we don't hear. So there is some people that are uncomfortable, and I think we need to have that conversation. And What's we the conversation need we need to have? Why, why the are conversation about where that comes from. So when you go out and speak to people about when they say, and people will say this mm. to me, um, I'm worried about immigration, I think that's taking my job. What would you say to is that? that? Is that understanding why that is? My, my answer to that is like, okay, tell me about your workplace, what has happened, tell me about your neighbourhood, what has happened. Um, and... Sometimes there isn't a story of immigration and sometimes there is and there is a concern about resources and there is a concern of jobs But very often it's oh um, These people are coming and they're undercutting wages But when you look at wh who is allowing that undercutting to happen, it's the bosses So it's a misplaced anger. So what happens are is that you're blaming immigra immigrants and you it's, it's that that story is not really being heard about the bosses We're not you know, it was the bankers that crashed the economy, mm. right? We have to remember why all of this stuff has happened and it's because of, of an elite a Economic liberal elite not just a progressive yeah. John you'll come back in here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know Let's say you've got a company Okay, and you're competing in your industry against your competitors and you have um, the situation where the government has allowed our labour market to be massively oversaturated and that's driven down wages and you've got to compete. You want to drop your operating costs. You may be the most patriotic person in the country, but from a business perspective, it's impossible to deliberately pay more uh, to employ a, a local person than someone who's come in from abroad. Now, the fact is, if the government had a policy that said, look, we're going to control immigration, we're not going to oversaturate the jobs market, we're going to allow uh, wages to rise Lowest unemployment for 42 years in this country at the moment. So, so, well, yeah, the, the situation... I'm, 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 I'm so sorry, but I didn't actually get a chance to make my point, and that is that patriotic employers who will... Patriotic em employers. Patriotic employers, like the kind that um, Pfizer is saying are the cause of the problem by employing uh, foreigners rather than locals, if it were government policy to control migration, they'd all be on an even playing field. Do we need and more patriotic employ employers, people. do you believe? It doesn't matter whether they're patriotic or not. The fact is you cannot blame the employer, you blame the government. because All authoritarian populism represented by the Wilders Party, you know, their extreme anti Islamic agenda. Then you've got much more kind of mainstream and decent populists. I would include UKIP in that. Uh, but the argument now is about how we kind of how we give somewheres a bigger legitimate voice. They they feel and have been to some extent excluded from the political agenda. The real argument now is, I think, amongst the people that run society still, which is which is the anywhere class, 
about 20-25% of the population. And you can see an argument going on now between those who say, my God, we've screwed up here, we've really got this wrong. Uh, you know, we have not been representing the views and interests of a large part of our population. Uh, and those who say, no, you know, these are the barbarians, you know, we must double down. But there's also an agenda of buying off the, the votes of those the people and moving on their the outcome agendas. of that yeah. debate that the whole future yeah. of politics depends on. Well, let's, you, you mentioned UKIP, John Rees. Uh, who are the ordinary people that have been left behind? What do they think? What do they believe? And why are they very often antipathetic to the liberal consensus? Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, because the intelligentsia, the elite, liberal, highly educated people who think they represent the ordinary people and who often campaign vociferously, vociferously uh, to, to help ordinary people, frankly don't understand the ordinary people. You do? Uh, I, I honestly believe that UKIP is most in touch with the ordinary people, and I think that was proven on the 23rd of June last year. You know, you had a situation, Nikki, where on the 22nd of June, three quarters of our allegedly you know, representative um, you know, you know, elected people in Parliament came out in favour of remaining in the European Union. And then the next day, uh, we proved quite clearly that the majority of people in this country want Britain but to rule itself. Your leader got kicked in the backside in Stoke. Oh, oh yes, no, absolutely. Right? Yeah. That, that, that's obvious. So what do the because, people believe? Yeah. How would, how would yeah. you characterise the beliefs of the ordinary people okay. which okay. are at odds with the liberal elite? What party is in, actually in government across Europe, or unless you include Poland and Hungary, as some people do. Uh, but I think populism does represent a, 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 I mean, at least a partly a legitimate reaction to the over-domination of our politics by... Um, a quite a large group of people, um, most of them perfectly, perfectly decent people. In my book, I call them the anywheres as opposed to the somewheres. They tend to be highly educated. They tend to be quite mobile. They tend to favour openness because it tends to benefit them. And they have dominated all the political parties educated. in Britain. Highly educated, you know, been to, a, been to a good university and so on. And they have dominated the political agenda to an extraordinary extent. If you think of the huge expansion of higher education itself and the much less good options for people that don't take the university path, if you think of the so-called knowledge economy and the disappearance mm. of all those kind of middle status jobs that, that lots of people used to enjoy and, and that, that uh, are not there so much. If you think of, of, of large-scale immigration, you think of fr how freedom of movement People can take advantage of it if they're highly educated. You're a lawyer, you go and work in Berlin for a few years, you're, you don't feel threatened by it at home. If you're a production worker in food manufacturing, one third, 120,000, mm. one third of all people working in food manufacturing now come from Eastern Europe. That's just happened in the last 10 years. You, you, f you see it as competition, you see it as a threat. What about the social and agenda, social progress that has happened? Uh, you know. oh, I mean, most of the people that I call the some somewheres go along with that. I mean, they, I, I think one has to think of that there is what one might call, some people would think it a contradiction in terms, something I call decent populism. People who have, if you look at the huge liberalisation in British society since the, the early 80s on race, on gender, on sexuality, mm -hmm. most be the vast majority of people in this country, including the more, more settled, communitarian, rooted somewhere people, go along with all those changes. And I think you, that you see that expressed through the different kinds of populism we have. I think there is, there is some pretty hard core. Today on The Big Questions, gaining power through populism, the route to happiness, and forgiving the people who hurt us. Good morning, I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. Today we're live from the Michelston Community College in Cardiff, Welcome everybody to the big questions. <laughs> now this week the Dutch held a general election. Uh, Hurt Wilders far right party of freedom won 20 seats and was only beaten by the centre right People's Party led by Prime Minister Mark Rutte, which gained 33 seats. But Mr Rutte had to emulate some of the populist sentiments espoused by Mr Wilders to secure his victory. And next month the Front National's leader Marine Le Pen's anti-immigration and anti-Muslim ideas will be put to the test in the French presidential elections. Polls predict she will go through to the second round in May. And in September, alternative for Deutschland, the German far right will challenge Mrs Merkel's reign as Chancellor. Populist parties and policies have been gaining ground here too, with the Brexit vote and in Wales, UKIP's seven seats in the Welsh Assembly. The idea that ordinary people have been exploited
by a privileged liberal elite seems to have taken hold across the continent. But is that about to change? Are Europe's powerless taking control? David uh, Goodhart, I must say, you've written a very interesting book about this, David. That's, well, that's a plug over. OK. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, uh, you can um, uh, expand some of the ideas in it. This is the, the dispossessed, isn't it? The ignored, the neglected, the marginalised, the powerless, kicking back. What are they kicking back against? Well, I think that's true, although we should remember that not a single populist...